KPIs become very difficult, actually as a CFO probably you have a problem because you lose the attention of the manager. Everybody has opinions, everybody has strong backgrounds in the areas and they want to implement what they think is best, but that's not the purpose of a team. The purpose of a team, again, is going in one single direction and you need to make sure we all go there. As CFOs, we've evolved from a pure accounting role towards risk management. That's something that is very, very important nowadays. And how you onboard or how you use AI in your corporations is one of the new risks that was not there probably five years ago and now has to be in every single company. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deveco Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends, and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Alex Sarikov, and today I'm excited to have Daniel Navas, Chief Financial and Operating Officer at Defiant.ai. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Daniel! And thanks for joining me today. Hi, Alec. Nice to meet you. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. Okay? Sounds good. Career in tech gave me... A lot of experience, a lot of insights, and I've seen a lot of things. Career in tech deprived me... Not anything to say, honestly. I've enjoyed every single day. My main superpower is... Listen. My main weakness is... Sometimes lack of patience, I would say, <laughs> but this changes every day. When I'm afraid, I listen to feedback from a lot of people. Sounds good. What was your first step into the business world? Did you always envision a leadership role or was it just a journey of discovery? Journey of discovery. I don't know if anyone joins, to be honest, uh, as a leadership. I started my career at Deloitte. I would say it's a very typical school to start with. I spent five years in Deloitte in Barcelona, Spain, doing typical, started as an auditor, which is very typical. Then I moved to M&A type of roles, which I enjoyed so much. And this was for me like a discovery that I wanted to move outside of the consulting piece, more to the real life business. So I would say, yes, it was a kind of a discovery journey. What was the defining moment that shaped your transition from traditional finance roles into tech and AI? When I was at Deloitte, I had little exposure to tech because that industry is very much focused on services. But I was very lucky that when I decided to move outside of the consulting world, I found a very small but very interesting company named Seitel, who was very, very interesting. They had a very cool product, very much into R&D, focused on online voting. So they decided to hire me as a financial controller. And that's when I started deep diving into technology. And since then... As both CFO and COO roles, how do you strategically integrate financial planning with operational execution on a daily basis? To be honest, I think that you cannot take away finance from any role. I was lucky enough, I would say, to me to start my career in finance because it gives you a very solid framework to analyze everything you do. In businesses, everything goes down to activities, to people, to completing tasks, to meeting milestones, all those things. And this is, and again, a financial KPI or financial closing gives you a good perspective on how to handle everything. Right? So I really recommend all managers, and that's why at the end of the day you do MBAs and postgraduates like this, to get more understanding of how finance works. Because this gives you, if you have not been trained there, a very good framework on how to analyze your activities. And since then, I manage operations, but I am also supervising sales, marketing, other functions where I do that all the time. I right? try to break down all activities into a larger framework to give it a more or less financial, I would say, framework overall, sorry to repeat the word, but how to analyze your operations. How do you approach risk management at Define.ai? Risk management, I would say, has an impact on everything you do, as I said earlier. It, it's a combination of likelihood of events happening and a financial impact. You cannot isolate them from any risk you take. So when you have to analyze risks, what you have to do is try to break down all activities that happen in a company into smaller pieces, aggregate them into families, but take those units of events that can happen and start to categorize them and have a working team. You can have the parties, your own internal team, but you need to start understanding what's the likelihood of that event to happen. And if it happens, what can be the financial impact of the company? I would say cyber attack, losing a customer, product fails, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So break it down in many activities as you can and then have a bunch of people as much as possible 
to start to understand the likeliness of that to happen. And then you can start building a whole set of risks and build a map of likeliness of those events to happen. Then you put a financial impact. And then finally, you start working on mitigation in case those risks happen. And this applies to everything you do. It can apply to marketing, can apply to sales, can apply to project delivery, to product, finance itself, treasury, name them, right? People are paying more attention to AI around the world these days. What should financial leaders do for their companies to use AI responsibly? That's a very good question. Here, especially at Define, we have specialized on what we call responsible AI. Not everything is possible. Not everything should be allowed. In our case, what we do is we collect or create data in what we call a responsible manner. I recommend everybody to download our ethical manifesto, which is available in our website. And here we explain how we understand what AI means. You cannot scrape the web for data. You need to pay for the contributors or the owners who have created AI. Now, for example, podcast is a very good example. You can use podcasts to train AI because it's a very high quality speech, but you cannot download it from YouTube and put it in your model, right? You need to have the authorization and how you need to pay the owner of that podcast, that intellectual property, before ingesting it into a model. That's a very simple, but it applies to every type of data that you can work. And it has to do with your question, you know, with finance, but also risks. As CFOs, we've evolved from a pure accounting role towards risk management. That's something that is very, very important nowadays. And how you onboard or how you use AI in your corporations are one of the new risks that was not there probably five years ago and now has to be in every single company. Because let's be honest, everybody's using AI. What type of tools are you using? Where did they get the data from? You need to do that diligence before implementing any tool. If you are developing AI yourself, where do you get the data from? So all these questions matter. And I recommend every CFO or every finance leader out there to pay attention to those questions. Because if you don't do maybe in a few years, unexpectedly you'll receive a lawsuit by someone who has realized that you have used their data without proper consent. Interesting case. How do you think OpenAI train their models? I don't know. That's very difficult to know. The only thing I know which is publicly available is they've received several lawsuits in the past, but I also know that they are changing behavior. We've seen that. They are trying to onboard data in a responsible manner. I've seen that happening recently. We are one of the largest marketplaces of data in the market, and they've came to us recently also asking for data and how we onboard data. They've been making a lot of questions, which are the right questions to make. How do you see AI and automation playing a role in the context of your industry? Everywhere. Well, my industry is uh, where I operate is actually AI, right? So difficult to say, but it's applying to every industry, let's be honest. And it's going fast from healthcare to education, financial services, it's everywhere. And as any previous technological revolution that we had in the past, I think it's very important to embrace it because it's not going to replace any job, let's be honest. It's going to make all of us more efficient so we can focus on adding value. It's where it matters, right? So it will replace manual processes, automate them, and improve overall efficiencies in the companies. And that's, for example, for a CFO or any finance leader, we need to have clear KPIs on performance and efficiency. Revenue by employee, cost by employee, things like these are the relevant metrics to have. How much tools are being used? How much do we spend on those tools per revenue? All those KPIs will become more and more relevant and AI can play a really critical role there. But those are basic APIs. I think everyone has them. You don't have to be a CFO to have those metrics. No, no? at all. That's why I told you at the beginning, every leader should have clear KPIs and strong financial understanding to create it. Again, CFOs are moving outside of the typical accounting rule and apply their knowledge everywhere. So we make sure that all the leaders, all the managers in the company embrace these KPIs or metrics quickly. If KPIs become very difficult, actually as a CFO, probably you have a problem because you lose the attention of the managers. They need to be simple. They need to be relevant for the business to perform, right? If you start having a dashboard of I know 50 KPIs, you may have a problem. It's more important to focus on a handful, a few, 5, 10, 15, very clear KPIs and make sure that you're more and more efficient on them. Introducing new internal tools can be challenging. What steps do you take to make sure the process goes smoothly? I would say it's similar to the ones I mentioned earlier for the risk management. It's very important for any leader that is implementing tools to go down to the details. If you are trying to implement a CRM, 
an ERP or a name, any tool, you need to understand the whole processes that are applying at the company. The last thing you can do is impose a tool that you like, you've been referred to, on top of the actual processes of a company, because that's probably the main reason for a failure of a tool implementation. Again, you need to understand all the processes and tools already in place and people interacting with those tools to start making those decisions. Then when you have that detailed analysis, you can start understanding, okay, this is working, this needs to be improved, this has to be replaced. And then when you have that clear perspective, then you can start analyzing potential tools and decide which is the best solution for you. Plus, one thing is very, very important is that you need to make sure that the whole tool ecosystem that you have, these tools communicate with each other automatically as much as possible. It has happened so many times before that one department or division works completely isolated from others, implements a tool that doesn't communicate with other tools. I would say it's a very big reason for a failure because then you always will need humans on the loop, call it this way, or people that take information from one platform, place it in the other one, or even worse, place it in an Excel. So everybody places things in the Excel because again, then you have subjectivity, but you only have manual work and that will probably fail. I recommend pay a lot of attention on the tools that you implement. They may be slightly more expensive, but if they communicate one to each other, you have higher chances of succeeding. What qualities do you look for when building a high-performing team in an AI-focused company? As in any company, first of all, I need to say attitude mainly. Of course, they need to have a strong technical background in their area, but what I focus more is their attitude. It's like when you're sailing, if you have a team of, I don't know, five, ten people, but one or two of them are are sailing in opposite directions, the boat will sink. It's very important that we're all going the same direction. And as a team leader, you need to make sure constantly to move into the right direction. Everybody has opinions. Everybody has strong backgrounds in their areas and they want to implement what they think is best. But that's not the purpose of a team. The purpose of a team, again, is going in one single direction and you need to make sure we all go there. So again, attitude is the main reason. Especially when I do interviews, I pay special attention to not, I would say, very subjective items, right? Are they on time? Are they making questions? Are they educated? Are they asking questions about the existing culture of the company? Things like this tell me that they will really be good team members when they join. Define the AI is headquartered in Seattle with offices mm -hmm. in Lisbon. What are some strategies for building a united team with members from various time zones and cultures? I think that's a kind of easy task, right? That's an ongoing challenge, but in this company, in every company in the world. Since COVID, a lot of companies have gone hybrid, which is our case. For example, in the US, we are headquartered in Seattle, sure, but we have people all around the country. Then we have a large office in Lisbon. We have a lot of people also in Porto, which is a city north of Portugal, but also we have a lot of people all around the world. And the main success factor for all this is communication. You need to have proper tools in place. In our case, we're a Microsoft house, so we use Teams all the time. So you need to make sure that you have team gatherings, face-to-face -face on a regular cadence, these communication tools, and also you need to have in place platforms where people can go and express their opinions when they feel isolated, when they need to talk with other people, when they have problems, because the only way to do this is constant communication all the time. And there's a lot of different time zones, different cultures, so you need to make sure that everybody is aligned in one single place and they can speak there. What tools are you referring to accept teams, of course? Email meetings, I would say one on ones quarterly gatherings. We also have a quarterly meeting where all the company talks at a single place. No, I, I, I thought you were yeah, I thought you were referring to some specific tools like virtual offices within the company. This is what I meant, but okay, got it. No, also it's difficult and I would recommend not to fragment it too much because when you start having like three, four tools, you start creating silos and fragmentation. Yeah. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising from talent perspective? Portugal. I've been here for three years. I'm coming from Spain and I cannot speak more highly of this country. There's a lot of talent here. They have a fantastic English level. I was extremely surprised by that. Very good schools and a fantastic attitude. And plus, on top of Portuguese people, I would say we have a lot of foreigners living in Portugal for many years now. And this is creating a very, very nice ecosystem. You can see that in the amount of startups that are flourishing every year, new venture capital companies that are establishing here. So I think the next years are even better, are going to be even better for this country. Yeah, I'm sure after 2022, it became more tech-oriented. Yes, it's a fantastic city as well. And not only the people, but also the food, the weather, the city itself, it's a jewel. What are your thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing tech function? Well, the advantages are clear. It's very quick. So if you have an urgent need tech function that you don't have in-house, it's the best way to go. But it has certain cons, of course. It's more expensive in general, and you lose what I said earlier, communication and integration with the rest of the teams. So in our case, we definitely use that for short-term periods 
when you have an urgent need for a specific customer or a specific project, it's fantastic to externalize a function. If it's something that you expect to continue having in 9, 12 months from now, I highly recommend to internalize it. I would say it really depends also company by company, but that's how we do it here at Defania. How do you see the role of IT outsourcing evolving in the context of your industry future? A lot, a lot. AI, again, is playing a huge role into this. And, well, you again, you're using externalization of IT services in many areas. There's not a single department in our company that has no impact from IT or AI. So, again, if they have urgent needs of help, we always could look outside. Right, the third party that we may know or we may not know and try to onboard them quickly so they also understand what we do and they can be efficient as soon as possible. If not, again, we internalize it. Sometimes we just use third parties that to internalize them. But again, it's a case by case. But again, AI is playing a role everywhere. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you give to companies considering IT outsourcing but concerned about losing control? or their technology projects. As I said earlier, even with fragmented teams, right? It's constant and clear communication, creating the channels and having recurrent meetings to understand what progress update with that external party. Daniel, thank you very much for participating in my video podcast. Your experience is definitely useful for the audience. I'm sure they will find some interesting notes, suggestions, points. Yeah, thanks for joining me today and spending time with me. It was a pleasure. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Daily Co Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.